attempting to simplify the complexities of entrepreneurship and what makes for a good life. This podcast is riddled with questions, ideas, philosophical food for thought, tangible takeaways, and honest stories that highlight one man's journey. My name's Evan Shank. Welcome to the podcast, Which Way Now? What's going on, everybody? Welcome to a very special episode of the podcast. I brought on a guest. So this is the first time this is going to be fun. I've got my good buddy, Joel Eschenbach, here with me. He is a fellow marketer, business owner, business growth coach, um, family man. We talk about family all the time, you and I. Uh, Five kids, which I'm like, kudos, buddy. Kudos to you. And uh, just a good marketing friend. Um, Hey, what's going on, Joel? Thanks, Evan. Hey, I'm glad to be here, man. It's going to be fun. Look forward to the conversation. Yeah, for sure. So obviously, we're we're good friends and we talk multiple times a week at this point. And actually, you just moved away from me, unfortunately, yeah. right as we were becoming it's good true. friends. So I'm in Sarasota, <laughs> Florida, which is where you're... Ba- that's where you spent all your time, basically. And you've uh, you've uprooted. Yeah. Yeah. Living in Charlotte, North Carolina now. We moved just over a year ago. So I love that, that so far. Is that why you have a sweater on and you're double that's, layer? Yeah, that, that, right. Cold. That's why I'm wearing long sleeves. It's like in the 40s and 50s outside. It's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, I mean, thanks to technology, we can continue to talk and work together and do fun stuff. But we've been having some really cool conversations just as I share some of my thoughts of business growth and talking podcast. You've got your own podcast that you can probably plug at some point in this conversation. Um, so I've learned a lot from you. And I thought this was a really good chance for me to step out of my comfort zone, as I've spoken in previous episodes, of doing something new. Bring in a guest. Let's hear from some other experts. And uh, we can all learn together, grow together, and life is just more beautiful that way. So I'd yeah. say before we really get into anything, just tell us a little bit about you, what brought you into who you are now, passions, hobbies, the whole story, however you'd like to take it. Okay. Yeah. I mean, there's so many directions I could go there, right? But I think the easiest way to explain it in context of what we're talking about is, you know, I started out really out of high school as doing graphic design. Uh, Graphic design was kind of my degree I went into, among other things. And then at some point after working for other people, I was like, I want to start my own freelance business. So I started with freelance graphic design and 2006, um, eventually branched out and turned into a marketing agency. Uh, We're now Notion Design Group, and there's a team of five of us, and uh, we help with small businesses. So everything from branding to websites to, um, you know, we also, I do some coaching consultant, consulting, like you mentioned. So that's kind of the professional side. On the personal side, it's, you know, yeah, you mentioned I have five kids uh, my wife is actually, Tara is actually involved in the business too. So we have a whole lot of fun between working together and parenting together and you know how all that goes. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I could share a lot more, but that's kind of the quick, quick overview at this point. And we should talk because of course, in my background, I'm showing off some of my guitar, my axes. <laughs> yeah. And we yeah. are musician buddies as well. What yes. instrument do you play and how did you get into that? Let's, let's talk fun stuff real quick for a second. Yeah, drums. So I, gosh, started playing drums when I was in eighth grade, eighth grade talent show. I remember. Yeah, that was like a big deal. And I did a drum solo. So I I was starting to learn a little before that, but I remember doing this drum solo and I think I still have it recorded. If you look at it now, I completely lose time. I get, you know, start off with just a beat and then it's getting faster. And by the time I'm drum solo, it's just everywhere and it's just a wreck. But, um, that was it. I was I was hooked after that. Uh, so I've been playing drums since then. Still love to play. I mean, I play a little guitar and sing too, but drums are always, that's that's my love. That's the bread and butter for you. Yeah. That's so funny. Talent shows, man. What a fun time. I've got my own <laughs> talent show performance stories that I'll save for a different time. Enough yeah. about me. <laughs> <laughs> but I know exactly oh, yeah. what you're talking about, like losing timing, just being so nervous and yeah. the whole thing. But hey, you know what? It's all about pushing yourself into the fringes of where you're comfortable, learning about yourself in that process, and then making some decisions on what you can do next. And you start to find that you just expand over time and life becomes a little bit more beautiful as you go through it. And that's one of the big things for me with this podcast is to look at entrepreneurship, but see how it really 
pivots over and translates into creating a good life for yourself. Um, and it's a good way for us to all connect and grow together. So that's the aim of this podcast as a whole. So um, any conversation or story of personal challenge, whether it's in business or outside of it, I think it fits really well. And we're all human beings at the end of the day. So it all relates. Um, yeah. But, you know, I just released this episode um, just the other day, actually. And we're going to expand on the concept of basically idea to action today. That's something that's been really heavy on your mind as we were kind of preparing for what we wanted to talk about. And wh- why does that mean a lot to you? And um, why don't you just kind of take it away on that? And I'll ask some questions as we get going. Yeah. So it's funny. I saw the other podcast and I was like, what a coincidence because you had asked me, what do you want to talk about in the podcast? And I said, here's what I'm thinking. And then I looked at your last week's podcast. That was funny. But uh, ultimately what I found is I mentioned the name of our company is Notion. So Notion is another word for idea, right? Mm -hmm. And it's typically an idea that you're not really, you haven't really thought through in depth. It's a quick idea. It's like, I have this notion about something and, and I want to kind of follow it through to see if it turns into anything. So my idea was 15 years ago, actually, I officially started Notion more like 12 to 13 years ago. But anyway, um, the idea was, okay, I have people coming to me all the time and saying, I want to do this thing. Can you help me do it? So helping you do it means everything from design and branding to like, hey, we need a website. We need you to help us like market this thing. And usually that's new businesses. And you know, since I started doing graphic design years ago, it's like 15 years of going through and saying, seeing people come up with ideas and failing to launch them well. So there's a, there's a, this thing of like, I can have an idea and I can have a great idea, but if I don't do anything with it, you know, great. It's just an idea. And how that translates into business itself is like, if it doesn't make money, it's not a business and that's fine. It doesn't have to be a business. It could be a hobby. But I like to talk about how do you turn your idea into a business and monetize that? And how can you actually live out your ultimate dreams and goals in life by taking this idea you have and turning it into something that makes you money? Yeah. Well, and even in the process of doing that, of taking those baby steps moving forward and saying kind of that fork in the road where it is, can this be a business or is this more of a hobby? What's the pros and cons to either? What do I want in my life? What's fulfilling for me? Where am I trying to go ultimately? So that I think that's probably a pretty early fork in the road for people of like, what would be some tips, advice, anything that you have on discerning the difference between, yeah, you could do something with this. This could be a business or it might just be something fun to do on the weekends, you know, or whatever, more hobby-like. Yeah. Yeah. Good questions. Because it's important. A lot of times we just have ideas and they ought to just remain in the idea realm. They don't really need to turn into something. But sometimes I see people, they're just really passionate about an idea, but they don't know how to get it off the ground. Um, You know, my first point of advice would be wait a month. You know, it's like you get an idea and you get really excited about it, but ideas come and go. And I feel like if you wait a month and you're still really passionate about that idea a month later, and you're really starting to consider, okay, I'm ready to work through it, then you might be on the right track in terms of taking an idea and actually turning it into like a business or monetizing it in some way. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's something that I know that I've dealt with. And once again, all of us being humans, I would, I'm growing to the point realizing that if I'm wrestling with this, a lot of people are probably feeling the same way of just saying like, okay, no, I need to jump in. Like I need to go all in. I need to show commitment and hustle right out of the gate. And I mean, of course, we're flooded with all this information through social media and everything where you see these people that are ahead of you in life. Yeah. And I'm using air quotes for those that are listening and not watching us right now, um, where it's just like you feel like you need to move so quickly because you're so far behind. You know, like I turned 30 last year. So this year I'll be turning 31. And so in my head, I'm like, I'm behind. You know, mm. I've got kids, I'm behind. And I can get so focused on that, that it's hard to stop and smell the roses on some things and realize what, how far I've actually come. And a lot of that progression for me has come from holding off on certain things and being contrary to some of that grind hustle mode. Don't think, just jump, figure it out as you go. I've noticed that to be a real challenge for people. So that's, it's interesting that you bring that up. Wait, hold on a second analyze yeah. and look into into this thing a little bit more before you jump you know 
So I really like yeah. that you, you say that. Yeah, and I think you, something that piggybacks on that is, 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 look, is this something, is this idea that you have something you really enjoy? Um, and, and that sounds, that seems obvious, right? But sometimes ideas come to you if you're the type of person that is more entrepreneurial minded or you're a problem solver, you'll see things in the world around you and be like, somebody should do this. You know what I mean? And you're, you're like, oh, mm-hmm. what, you know, what would be a great idea? A great idea is if somebody created a business that, you know, came along and swept my front porch for me because, you know, and you get all excited about it for a minute, but then yeah. you're like, actually, I'm not really that excited or passionate about this. Right. In a, a month down the road, am I going to lose interest in this? If so, another reason to wait, it's probably not something for me because you need to be able to commit to this thing for the long haul or at least the, the semi short term or semi long term. I mean, yeah, absolutely. And I agree with that too. And I think to even dive a little deeper into that is just this, like, I asked myself, once again, I'll use myself as the example here. Like, okay, do I have to love every single part of this thing, you know, because mm. how many hats and how many plates are you spinning or wearing in the process of going, you know, from a want to be entrepreneur into actually taking the steps and taking action on that? And how do you, do I have to love all of it? Because there's things that I don't necessarily love in this, but should I be paying attention to that or just saying, okay, well, you know what? It's necessary. Just like um, you know, you want to be in good shape, but it requires you to sometimes pass on the thing that you want to eat, go for the healthier right. option or right. get up a little earlier so that you can exercise. What do you think on that? Like this whole passion thing, do you have to love it all or no, is it okay no. if there's some like boring spots to it? Yeah, definitely not. I mean, you know, and that's where I think a lot of people get mixed up too is you don't, uh, there, it, you're, you're a strange person if you love every single thing that you do that's your work every single day. I mean, that's extremely rare. I think the goal here is, is this something I'm going to care about? The overall vision, uh, product, service I'm doing, what, how I'm helping people, what's that mission and vision? Do I care about that long-term? Am I, when I get up in the morning, I'm excited to use this service to solve a particular problem for a client. You know, is that something I care about? I think that's what we're looking for. There's always going to be the menial crap in the middle of it. And, yeah. I, and I think you get down to the nitty gritty on some of that. Like when I think about when people come to me with an idea and they're past that stage where it's just like, hey, what about this? When they're ready to put some time into it or when they're ready to spend some money on it. The next question I'm asking is, look, how many hours a week are you willing to put into this? H- hardly anybody asks that question. Yeah. Because this thing is going to take your time. We have a limited amount of time you know, how much time are you willing to commit to it? Yeah, well, absolutely. And I think, I mean, everything that you're saying is gold. And that is a lot of these first questions that people are running into because it almost seems like there's um, mixed signals if you're looking into reading people's Instagram posts and these successful people and putting yourself into that position and what's the right path for me and how do I know? So let's get back into this hypothetical. Okay, we've got this idea, this notion yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> I like that. That's, that's cool. I, I like the branding of that too. Um, but you have this idea and you're getting through the process of maybe you decided, okay, this is viable business, potentially, likely not hobby. I'd like to go the business route. What's the next step in that process for people in the very beginning of this execution phase? Yeah. Yeah. Good. So I, I would list a couple more things to ask yourself questions. So like one is, you know, I said hours a week and kind of what piggybacks onto that is, look, do you want this to be a side hustle or a full-time business to begin with? Mm. Those are very different questions. I think most businesses do start out as some sort of a side hustle um, because most people don't have the money to be able to just leave their full-time job and start something. But yeah. it's important to know where you're headed with it because sometimes if, if you say, I want this to be a full-time business, you're more than likely going to put yourself on the hook more than a side hustle. There's nothing wrong with that. Like if you want to have a side hustle and this is something you're just excited about that you like, and you want to get a little bit of extra money, that's cool too, because that's extra money on top of your regular paycheck. Mm -hmm. But, but I think that's an important question to ask. Where do I want to start? Do I want it to be a side business or a full-time business? Yeah. Um, And what do you mean by on the hook? Just, I I think I know what you mean, but for the sake of the conversation for the audience, what, what do you mean by that? 
Yeah. So on the hook is essentially you're you're responsible, right? I think the the story there is um, I, I think Seth Godin shared this one time on his yep. podcast. Yeah. And I'm I I'm, might butcher it, but I didn't really know what that term meant. But he was essentially saying that somebody comes into the bread shop or they used to, mm-hmm. and they would buy a loaf of bread and put it up on the hook. And and what they meant is so if somebody else came in and didn't have the money to buy a piece of or a loaf of bread they'd be able to take the bread off the hook and give it to the person who needed it. So essentially the idea is you're committing yourself to say, look, I'm, I'm giving away something and I'm really becoming responsible for, you know, what I'm doing. I, I'm even to the point where I'm giving it away to somebody else. Yeah. There's yeah. probably more to that story and that analogy, but that, that's, no, that's the way I remember that's about as good it. as I could have done with it, honestly, yeah. a little bit better, really. <laughs> um, yeah. And Seth Godin, he's a, he's an awesome dude. We're, uh, I mean, he's kind of like the godfather of marketing is the way that yes, I always say it. he is. Yeah, yeah, he really is. Yeah. So, um, and I think you were one of the first guys to actually turn me towards him and start listening to some of his stuff. Um, I think it's the practice, um, yeah. creative work or something yeah, like that. Yeah, that's a good one. Listening yeah. through, through on that one. But so then say they want to go into full-time, coming, coming back to this process that we've been speaking on. Mm-hmm. They want to mm-hmm. go full-time, they're committed, they're passionate about it. They know that they can invest the time or arrange their schedule to do so. And they're jumping in and they've waited yeah. on it as well. They're jumping yep. in. They're jumping in. They're ready to move forward and start. Here's, I'm ready to do it. Here's, here's where I'm going to get into the real practical stuff here. Yeah. Um, and this path, so I've got, I've got five things, like a five-step plan per se, you know. Yeah. Um, in, you know, I, I will preface it by saying this works a little bit better with service-focused companies. If you're developing a product, for instance, like a software product, software as a service, or you're selling a you know particular product, whether it's a food or it's you know something you're actually creating a tangible. I've got a lens cap for a camera here. If you're making the next new lens cap, mm-hmm. you're going to have a tough time following this. So this is mostly focused on hourly or service-based businesses. Good to know. Um, yeah. For sure. So, and I'll give you some examples as I go. But uh, the number st- number one step for me is make a thousand dollars, because hmm. one of the things that people will do is they'll think, "Oh man, I need to get my logo and my website and my marketing and you know my my LLC set up and you know get my business established and get trademarked." And they spend all this money, and they haven't made any money. So right. there's this idea, and, th- and this is for a number of reasons. One is, I think you've got to make some money out of the gate to really show that you've proven your product or service. You know, is somebody going to buy it? Is, it? Does anybody care about it? Um, I also think it's a motivating factor. Once you make $1,000, you're like, oh, this is cool. Like, I can make some money on this. This feels good. Um, it, it's a, a huge motivator in terms of just putting money into something and never getting anything out of it. Yeah. Um, Something else that it does is it forces you to kind of figure out what is this thing you're selling? What's the minimum viable product? You know, the term MVP, MVP, if you've ever heard that. Oh, yeah. Minimum viable product or service. Yeah. Um, Because if somebody's buying it, then you're going, okay, somebody's willing to spend their hard-earned money on this. So it must mean something to them. And it kind of, you've got to figure that out a little bit before you sell you know, but you don't have to figure it all out. You can kind of figure it out as you go after you're making a little bit of money on it. Okay. So, and that's interesting that you say that. We'll pause there and kind of look at that because yeah, I would think, you know, if I didn't know better, I would think that I need to come up with my product first or the MVP, the minimum viable version of this thing. And which is going to require more research and investment of time and other resources such as money before you've made that dollar like you're talking about. So it's interesting because you would think that you need that to be able to make the first dollar. But sometimes you can make, and whether it's 1K or whatever the number is, you can make some change without really even having anything. Like you're just kind of shooting from the hip and just feeling it out. And you're leading with your passion and your commitment. That's what you kind of lean back into as you're selling these first things, right? And then right, right. and then once you've made that money, that 1K, um, then really go back in and start t- tightening the screws to what would be considered your first iteration of MVP. Is that correct? 
Yeah, that's correct. And, and obviously I'm leaving a little bit out there in the sense that you got to know your idea is that you got to know what you're trying to sell, right? Right. So, so an example is, so that's obvious, right? You, you can't just say, hey, somebody give me a thousand dollars. <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna figure out how to take that idea and at least sell it to enough people to where you can make. And I say a thousand. It does. It could be. A, it could be a hundred. It could be five hundred. But I feel like a thousand dollars in most businesses is a pretty decent chunk of like, okay, somebody's buying something from me. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you an example. Um, uh, my sister in law. So she started a charcuterie business, but mm. the way she started doing it, she made she, and she worked for another company and. She just started on the side um, making charcuterie trays for family events, right? And they were amazing. She did an amazing, amazing work on them. But then she's like, huh, I wonder if anybody else would be interested in these. Well, of course people were, right? Because they came to whatever she was hosting. They had one of the charcuterie trays. They were, she was like, this is amazing. They love them. Okay, great. I'll make one of these for your next party. So she just started making trays here and there for parties. And before you know it, she's made $1,000, right? Yeah. So- she didn't think, she didn't establish the, I don't know all the details, but as far as I know, she didn't spend the time to establish the business and set up the LLC and do all the things right out of the gate. It was, hey, I'm just going to make some trays for people. And food business is a great one to do this in because it, it, the overhead is fairly low and you can just start making money pretty quickly. Sure. Um, but you didn't get too caught up in all of the details that comes with launching a business if you're overthinking it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And once again, I mean, that's, I think what a lot of people do, I think to continue to um, really point out the theme here is to go from idea to anything else requires action of some sort, mm -hmm. rather than just shelving all these thoughts and thinking like, oh yeah, I could be great at business. It's, and there's always that caveat word of could, I could be, how do you know? Cause it's, it's this process of action. And a lot of people I guess there's an upside and a downside, but a lot of people to start feeling like they're moving forward. I'm, I am this way where I'll go, yeah, I need a website. I need my LLC. I need to get a newer computer. I need to do this and that. And I'm taking action. And it's like, yeah, sure. But these things are going to happen anyway over time and they'll happen when they need to. And you'll know when that is, if you're, prioritizing the process of turning your service or your product into something that people want to buy and going yep. through that process, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, it, it gives you motivation. You're making money on it. It's like, you're starting to realize I have what it takes to do yeah. this. And I like doing this or I don't like doing this. Um, and that's, that's a huge. big part of it because sometimes something should stay a hobby. So if you spend a lot of time, like, and I'm not saying, look, if you've got a name and stuff, buy a domain name, whatever. But, if you get too caught up in like building everything out, but you haven't really sold anything yet, you could get six months, a year into this and go, you know what? I've spent a month. I don't really want to do this. And I, you know, I've seen this happen. I've seen the, the I, so I talked about the charcuterie business. Well, on the opposite, I've had, I've had this happen many times with clients coming to get websites, but one particular client one time came in and said, look, I want to build this event business and I want to build it all over the place. And she had everything she needed. She spent a ton of money with us on a website that was fully functional. And, you know, at the time, I wasn't going to turn the money away. We, you know, it was a great website that sure. we built. But but I was thinking at the time, like, it might have made sense to try this on a local level, a little bit smaller before spending the time to develop the software and the website. But I see that all the time is that people come and they spend a bunch of money with us to build a website or marketing or whatever, and they haven't even really sold much yet. And then what inevitably happens is they don't sell anything and it never makes money and it kind of falls apart. Yeah, yeah. Just kind of a bit of the cart before the horse type of thing. Right. Not really thinking very strategic about it. And I mean, and once again, you know, another life principle that I'm going to spout here is like, the world is not black and white. The, right. Everything is gray. It's, it's yeah. all just about how you move throughout the gray. And that's not just... I mean, gray sounds kind of like humdrum, but that's not what I mean. <laughs> but there's room for interpretation and tweaks and modifications for everybody's circumstance and situation. So even the things that we're going through here, these are really good guidelines. And I, there's, I'm sure we've got a few more that we can tap into here in a second. But take the information from this podcast, 
from others that you're listening to, from things that you're seeing from the big guys on LinkedIn or whatever, the people that you lean into, find the common denominators, filter it through with what you're interested with and continue down that process and figure out what makes the most sense. But don't get caught up in some of the nitty gritties that aren't actually moving the needle for where you're trying to go because you're just kind of spinning your wheels and spending money, honestly. Yeah. Well, and that's obviously the premise of our conversation too, is like what we're talking about here is building a business, turning an idea into a business. And the definition of a business is something that makes money. So, you know, if you want to take an idea and turn it into a hobby, it's totally different. But if you actually want to make money on something eventually, start making money out of the gate. How can you make money out of the gate? So that's it. You know, one more thing on that point is that when you, and we'll hit this again in a minute, but when you make money, a thousand dollars out of the gate, mm-hmm. it gives you an idea of in a small market or small setting on what people are willing to pay money for. So we hit, you know, we, I talked about that a minute ago, but it gives you the ability to test that and then retest it again and go, okay, well, they were willing to do this, but they weren't willing to, to buy that. So even though I was really concerned with this one particular service I was going to going to provide. Well, nobody really wants that. Instead, they wanted this. Yeah. You, know, you see those trends pretty quickly when money's tied to it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So then, okay, you, you're passionate about it. You decided to commit. Step one, make a grand. You did that. And you kind of said, to, to clarify for the audience, that number is a little bit arbitrary or um, yeah. is there it's a range on that for the people that are very like spreadsheet yeah. minded of like everything needs to be specific? Right. Is yeah. there a range? <laughs> There's a range, of okay. course. Perfect. You know, I, I think it depends on what's the product and service or service you're selling. Mm-hmm. You know, if, if you're selling, you know, coffee, for instance, versus consulting, consulting is right. going to be higher ticket per person that you're selling to. So, yeah, I mean, pick a number. If it's a hundred bucks, if it's five hundred bucks, hundred is a little too low. I'd say five hundred to a thousand because you want to make enough money to where you've talked to a couple of people. And typically a thousand dollars, it's more than one customer in most cases, not every case, but starting out for sure. And so for those that have a more of a high ticket, it's kind of how many interactions, how many handshakes, how many deals have you done? So maybe it's five deals. So maybe that turns into five grand instead. Sure. Sure. Okay. Gotcha. Very cool. So then you've, we've done that, that very first step, made some money. We're excited. Now we're going into refining and tuning up this this MVP, this minimum viable product that we want to bring out to the market. Where do we go from there? We think we've done something better than what we had before to make our first grand. Now what's next? Really, I would say, and again, this might be a little counterintuitive, but focus more on your audience. Build an audience, not the product. So yes, you need to build the product and the service. But what I find is that then people start to get really focused on the service or product they sell. Instead, focus on building that audience, people that would be interested in that product or service. So what do I mean by audience? I'm talking audience is simply someone who's, who wants or is willing to buy your product or service. You know, we use that term audience. A, a lot of people use it. I think it's thrown around a lot now. It's really just who's your target yeah. market? Who's the person that wants to buy that from you? Um, focus on those people. And, and I gotcha. think the question is, how do you find those people? You ask yourself a number of questions, right? So who are those potential customers? You know, some other things like who, who did you sell the first thousand dollars worth of products to? Mm-hmm. You know, where do they, where does that person spend their time? What do they do? How do, how do they communicate? How do you find them? You know, is it social media? Is it networking locally? Is it like the local coffee shop? Like, where do these people live? Where do they, you know, how can you communicate with them? And how can you show off the work? So you made a thousand dollars already. You're proven. So at that point, you've got the receipts. You're like, look, people pay for this. Right. How can you show off that work as testimonials to other people and say, look, you know, I can do this. Here's the product or service. Let's yeah. do it. Yeah. And so that's kind of where you're starting to, obviously, showing your reviews, case studies, testimonials, things like that. It's building some credibility that you're actually, you do what you say that you do. There's social proof. Um, it helps building towards authority in the space, which these are big terms in, in the marketing world um, where we right. spend a lot of our time um, with our clients. Um, so would you say that in this audience building um, step, this is where we're starting to figure out the marketing of this thing that we're doing? 
Is that where that starts to come in? Because some people yeah. maybe jump off the gate too quick into the marketing before anything else is put That's together. That's exactly what you're doing. Okay. You, you, this whole thing is you're living out marketing. You're making money and then you're, and then from there you're determining, okay, who are the people that want to buy this thing? So you're narrowing down the people that want to buy. You're also narrowing down the problem that you're solving for people. Because as you sell more of the product, as you reach out to the audience, it's going to be more and more obvious what the audience wants. Mm -hmm. So you think this always happens. You start a business or you launch a product or you launch a service and you think it's going to be this way, but you sell it to a handful of people and you realize it shifts to something similar, but yeah. different, usually better. Like, you know, I'll give you a, for instance, when we launched, um, so about 10 years ago, we did websites like everybody did them where it was like, you know, $5,000 or at that time, maybe $2,500 for a website. And it was a flat fee. You paid maybe 50% upfront, 50% when it was done. What I realized is that small business owners just didn't have a lot of money to spend, even 2,500 bucks. They couldn't drop that kind of money. Right. So we broke it out into monthly payments. Well, at that time, nobody was doing that in our industry. It was, it was really different and unique. Um, and we packed, it was like 150 bucks a month. It was way too cheap. And we put everything in it. We put like the kitchen, everything in the kitchen sink. Like you got a logo, you got a full website design, you got business cards, you got, it was everything you could think of a business would need for like 150 a month. <laughs> you get a car, you get a car. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right, exactly. Well, it almost killed us. It was, it was way too cheap and we were offering way too much. But, but my point here is that the, we included a free logo design or it was included in the cost. Mm -hmm. What we found over time is most people didn't really need that. Um, crazy mm, enough, gotcha. like we'd have half the people or more that would sign up and never use that logo design. So we took it out of the package eventually and raised the prices, but you know what I'm saying? So it, mm -hmm. it always changes over time, like opposite of what you think, or at least different right. than what you think it's going to be. So that's funny. I want to hone in on that for a second, right there at the end, you took something away from what you were offering and raised the prices. Mm -hmm. That's kind of a shocker. Yeah, You know, that's something that, <laughs> like, what? <sighs> Mind blown. More money, less to do, and come on. Right. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We did do that. And and that was over just testing it over and over again. It was also over realizing that we had underpriced it to begin with. Yeah. And, you know, you just, sometimes you don't know what the market's going to do until you get out there and test the market. Yeah. So, you know, 20 people could have told me that was too cheap, but you never really know. Um, and what we found over time is people were willing to pay more money for that service. Yeah, absolutely. And on the previous episode where I was kind of talking on some similar, some similar topic here with the idea thing is you got to put in the reps. Yeah. And as you're refining and building, well, you're starting by building the audience, but there's a refining process that's happening um, kind of in tandem, I would think, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, that's, that's going to be a part of it is putting in the work, doing the reps, and they don't all, all have to be the best. You're going you're gonna to be able to pull some gold out of everything that you do as far as the value of a lesson that can be learned, understanding your audience a little bit more, understanding the, the strengths and or the weaknesses of the current product, and then even going into, do I need to add? Should I now add more products? Or should I continue to refine what I have? Because maybe in that process, you start to realize, okay, the audience for this thing may not be actually the audience that I overall ultimately want to serve. And you start to pivot into a, a different audience through that process. Yeah, so absolutely. it's a, I would think, um, without sounding like I know, <laughs> but I would put my money in to say, like, you just have to be willing to get out there and try and fail try and succeed, figure out if it's still aligning with your passions as you move forward. And if you have chosen the path, like you're saying, of making this a business, um, make sure that it's profitable, man. I mean, yeah, because that's what you're yeah. investing into. So it needs to be investing back into you. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, another way of saying building an audience too, is you're doing data collection. You're, you're collecting, you're asking people questions. You're you're reaching out to people you know, and you can do that a ton of ways. And a lot of times we talk about audience and marketing, we're talking about like an email audience or a social media audience, or you're an influencer and you have an audience. But an audience, again, is somebody who wants to buy or, sell, or buy your service or product. So it could be people you just network with. 
in their potential yeah. customers. You're asking them questions. You're throwing them on your email list. One of the things I put about building your audience is there is a very practical step, or I would say collect email addresses. Mm. It, you know, however you can when you're networking, get email addresses as part of this process yeah. because those will serve you well later when you're actually getting into the marketing part of it. Yeah. Well, I'll I'll let you kind of sell for me here for a second. Isn't email <laughs> dead? Isn't no. email old? <laughs> Doesn't it not work? <laughs> <laughs> no, it does work. And and the thing is, it's the, it's really the only direct communication directly with a person that you have any control over. Yeah. Um and so and and I know this guy who writes really good emails. Oh gosh. Uh, I think his name's Evan Shank, but uh -oh. but I don't know, you may want to look into uh -oh. that. <laughs> well, and it's funny too cuz with the podcast, I mean, this will be my 7th episode. Um I haven't I may not have even said some of what I actually do to make my dollars and cents between when I'm recording the podcast. I talk about the podcast and what I want to do with it, but yeah. not specifically what I do outside of it. So yeah, email marketing automations, and that's where Joel and I, we're always talking. We rub elbows a little bit here and there on some of that stuff. So, And one thing on the audience before we move on and kind of start to put a bow on all of this and summarize it all, with audience, to clarify again, that doesn't mean followers specifically. That doesn't mean that it mm -hmm. doesn't mean followers, right? But right. I think that's we should really hammer that down since we're talking on this specifically because a lot of times, no matter what business you're in and no matter who you are really, a lot of times we kind of lean into metrics that are more vanity met metrics. Yes. It's not really anything that turns into something that's positive on the ROI side of things. You know, so yeah. audience versus followers, that's something that people really should make sure that they understand that before they move into it so that they have the right lens on that they're looking through. Yeah, that's a really good reminder. Um, just met with a lady the other day. She has a 5 million person reach on her Facebook page. Woo! She reaches 5 million people. No joke. We're both on our way. Yeah. <laughs> but here's the thing that's crazy about it. She's made almost no money. She has not monetized it at all. Now, in, in fairness to her, that hasn't, wasn't her focus at first. She was truly trying to help people. But she's gotten to this point. She's like, I've been pouring my life into this thing for years and years and years. I have this huge Facebook reach, and I've made almost no money. Almost no money. So she came to me, and she's like, how do I monetize this thing? But that's a perfect example of followers, but not a true audience that's willing to buy, not customers. Right. And so followers are fine, but yeah, vanity metrics, if you're, if you're just trying to gain popularity, that's different than running a business. Right. Um, they, those two can collide. Of course, followers can become an audience that are going to pay you, but a lot of times it doesn't work that way. Right. Well, and I mean, for me, like I put a little bit of effort into my Instagram. I try to stay at least mildly consistent, but I try not to pressure myself. I and mean, you and I have talked uh, before about just social media and some of the trials and tribulations of it. Um, yeah. It just feels like this like ball and chain on me sometimes because I feel like I need to be there, but it's like, I don't know that this is the best time spent right now where I'm at. But, you know, 600, 700 followers, something like that. I mean, it's really nothing to write home about, but it's all family, friends, and, you know, since some old friends from high school all the way through to where I'm at now. So, you know, I'm sharing my personal life, but also some of the stuff that I'm doing, like the podcast and what I do as a professional in the marketing space. And, you know, I could put some direct call to actions in there to really try to inspire um, some revenue out of it and see if any of these followers are part of my audience. But if you're out there and I'm talking to the listener right now is don't get discouraged if you all of a sudden you pivot and you jump into this idea that or this idea that you jump into as a business and you go for it and you're you're like logging your laps and you're putting in the miles and you're pushing it on social to your followers don't get disheartened if you it's crickets because that's still they support you they're following you but it might be a different type of support than the financial contribution in exchange for service or product. So don't let that bring you down, right? That would probably yep. be good, good for us to remember. Yeah, it takes time. You yeah. know, one of the adages I always, I tell myself literally all the time is everything takes longer than you think. Everything. Yeah. I love and that. in And in a time, you know, you're saying before in a time where everything is like, go, go, go. Everybody's, you know, I'm making a million dollars overnight and I'm launching this app and I'm launching this product and look at my marketing. And it's just a whole lot of bull. 
Mm-hmm. Most people that are truly successful have spent at least a decade doing it. That's not always true, but most of the time that's true. And yeah. we can be really tricked into thinking that's not because of things like social channels and stuff where people are just showing their successes and they're not showing the years of work they put into something. Right. Yeah. I mean, and that's the thing. You hear these stories of overnight success and it's like, ah, it's overnight to the eyes of the world. You know, it's yeah. overnight to the eyes of media and the story that they're producing, but there are laps that need to be logged to get there. So yeah. everything takes longer than you think. That's, Every t- that's, thing takes longer than you think. That's yeah. amazing. I love that. I wrote that down <laughs> for sure. So let's kind of go through and see what other steps you have and where we can start to kind of tie a bow on this thing. So idea, you chose to go to business. You made $1,000. You worked into an MVP, this minimum viable product. Um, and now you're in the process of building the audience and refining. You're collecting data. You're learning what they will buy, what they won't buy. Um, maybe the product market fits a little bit. Um, you're kind of there, but not quite. And you're learning that through all the, this data collection. Then at this point, I mean, we're starting to tiptoe into some of the marketing of this product yes. or service. Is it just a matter of, I'll use a a loose term of scale at this point? Do you just scale and continue to do your thing or what's the next part of this? Yeah, good question. One other thing about building an audience, don't forget, collect email addresses along the way. <laughs> yeah, It's kind of like those yeah. gold coins you're collecting in the game. Oh like, yeah, that's a great you're, you're collecting the gold coins and you don't know what you're going to use them for, but trust me, you're going to need them up the road. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, Well said, I'm glad you brought that up. But the other thing is you want to make another thousand dollars. Now you may say like, okay, this is getting a little ridiculous. Like, okay, we already made a thousand dollars. Why are we making another thousand dollars? Um, the idea here is you want to double, triple check. First of all, that this thing's going to sell, but more importantly, when you're going to make that second thousand dollars, or maybe that's 500 for you, like we said before, um, you're wanting to really spend this moment to reverse engineer go back and figure out how you've made this money and now talk about scale. How can you make the second thousand dollars faster? How can you automate it? How can you delegate it? How can you improve on the product? In, in the case I was saying, maybe you take something away that, that's costing you time, but isn't really making that much of a difference in the service you're offering. But maybe it's costing you five to 10 hours of work. You're like, I don't need this. No one's really need, using it. Right. So you're refining the product but you're doing that by saying, how can I make the second thousand dollars, but make it faster? Gotcha. So you made a thousand dollars, you built the audience, you're collecting email addresses, and now it's okay. How can I make the second thousand dollars faster than I made the first? Yeah. So a question that comes to mind, and we tapped onto it for a quick second earlier, but this is all kind of around sticking within the same lane of the service with, you know, just tweaks to that service or or product itself. This is still digging in and figuring that one out before jumping into because a lot of people they've got this one and it's working pretty well they've let's say they've made fifteen hundred dollars so they're doing pretty yeah. good yeah you know and it's like yeah. well okay so we'll use the example of an easy example of like a marketing agency you know so say i'm just i'm offering emails and it's you know i can do some email and copywriting and some of the automations behind it and then it's like okay well that's working pretty well i'm gonna I'm going to add SEO. I'm going to add content marketing. I'm going to add in whatever it is, paid media. Um, And a lot of times you find yourself drowning in all of these different sea of offerings that you have. And you're, once again, you're spinning your wheels because you're not making money. You could have spent that time figuring out, like you said, how to make money quicker, how to automate that. Because that's likely going to lead to not only more financial success in the business, and understanding your audience and the business more, but it's going to be more fulfilling for you because you have a sense of control over your life. Don't add more to your plate before you've even finished what's on the plate, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. People get bored too quick. I think we all get bored, especially entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, now let's add something else. It's like, (laughs) let's refine. Instead, let's focus on refining that thing that's actually making you money. Right. Um, And and so it's this stage, it's really this stage where you're refining your product or service and you're trying to do it better, you're trying to do it faster, you're trying to get yourself out of it more. And in that period, of course, you're getting to a point where you know now, what problem am I really solving? So 
Which is going to piggyback right into our fourth step. Are we ready to go to the fourth step? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, okay. Now it's create your marketing. Ah, okay. So it's taken a while, right? But so, and we'll talk about what that means, but when you're creating your marketing, by now you know who your audience is generally. You know the service that you're selling and you can make some money on it. You have hopefully a little bit of money that you've saved from the money that you've made bootstrapping it. This, this whole thing is bootstrap plan, right? But hopefully, yeah, hopefully you have a little bit of money where you can say, okay, well, maybe I can pay for a, a, you know, subscription to some tools or, you know, a website or, you know, a a logo design or branding or something like you have a little bit of money, but even more important, you're not wasting that money because you know what you're selling. At least you have a much better idea than trying to do that before you've sold a dollar at all. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, as you're breaking this all down, there's a lot of logic to each step. And these are baby steps. And some of these steps might take more time than the other. But if you follow this philosophy and kind of this, this, these guidelines, this is a really practical, tangible way for most anybody to go from idea, the thought of idea into wanting to do business into actually making business and doing business. Right, right. And I love that. I, you know, I, ha- I have a client who, to, to talk a little bit about, they follow this process and they've been super successful. They actually provide, they're a senior concierge service. Uh, mm. Sunways is their name. They're based in Sarasota. Awesome, awesome people. And, you know, they kind of took this approach in the sense that they worked on building an audience. Yeah, they sold some services. They help, they help aging, fa- um, I'm sorry, they help children of aging family members find a place to take care of. So whether that's assisted living facility or home care and all of the services connected to that, oh, you wow. know, helping their aging parents find a place to live, you know, their, their, the rest of their days in peace and love their life. And so but how they started that was, yeah, they helped people do that and they started to charge some fees for that, but they built an audience. They started to talk to everybody and anybody about, hey, do you have aging parents that need help? We'd love to help you. They started to talk about, they were passionate because they went through it with their own parents of not being able to find the providers, of struggling through that. So they built the audience. They made a little money. They made a little bit more money. And then they came to us. They had kind of pieced together a website. Then they came to us and said, let's really do this. We know this is going to work. We've proven the model. Now let's put some money behind the marketing and scale it. Yeah. Yeah. Once again, I mean, a lot of times people are kind of cart before the horse. And right. they want to set up their LLC first because it seems like you have to. It's necessary right. and you'll get there. But focus sure. on the important things, the things that are actually going to put food on your plate for you. And of course, yep. like you said, hobbies are great. Hobbies, like the guitars for me. You know, I don't make any money off of that, but you know, it, it, I guess I could if I wanted to. <laughs> yeah, I could. Actually, back in the day, I did a little bit. Oh, I did nice. a little bit. I mean, hardly enough to... Uh, you know, keep fresh underwear, but you know, (laughs) so, all right, this has all been really good. Um, this has been an awesome conversation. Thanks for taking the time to do this. Um, I told you before we got started, I said, okay, this is my first rodeo with the whole interview style podcast. So just give me some grace and, uh, just, uh, drag me along the way if I get off track or anything. But I think I think there's a lot here for people to be able to chew on and absorb. And this is definitely an episode for me that I'll be able to listen back to over the course of time. And that's what I love about podcasts in general is it's evergreen. And that's something too that you can start to think about in your marketing is, is content and all of those different verticals within marketing where we, I'm sure I'll bring you back in for another conversation where we'll dig into those nitty gritties a little bit more because that's a yeah. sea of confusion as well and yes. money that can get thrown down the drain really quick if you're not careful. Um, right. So thank you for your time. Is there any other um, steps or bullet points that you want to tack on to the meat and potatoes of what we've discussed today? And then past that, go ahead and take us into where people can find you. How can they connect with you? I know you're out there on LinkedIn. Do you have any offers you want to share to the audience that's here? Um, Just let us know. Yeah, I appreciate that. You know, the only thing I'd really tack on is that when you get to the point you're creating your marketing and and you're going to put that out there, take the time at that point and get it right. We'll talk more about that probably in the future. 
and then then from there, the sky's the limit. You can start scaling and making money. You know, the, the you know, I said make a thousand dollars, make another thousand dollars. Hey, at that point, make ten thousand, make a hundred thousand. You know, on yeah. and on. So so yeah. As far as uh, working with me, so I, I like to break it up in three categories. You know, you've got the done for you. So if if you're at this place where you need help with your marketing, maybe you're at this point in your point in your new business or an existing business, you just need help with marketing. Uh, our agency, notiondesigngroup.com, we do branding, websites, ongoing marketing services, everything from you know email to also um, SEO and AdWords, all that fun stuff, helping you get marketing strategy in place. Evan helps us out with that too. <laughs> so that's done for you. Done with you. If you're the type of person, you're like, I want to do some of this myself, uh, but I need some help. Uh, I offer business coaching. So this type of stuff, if you go to littlefishcoaching.com. Uh, I do, I take on a number of clients, just do business coaching. And, and we have conversations like this, like, hey, I'm stuck in my business. Uh, we also follow the business made simple framework uh, in, in, the, in that coaching. And then finally, do it yourself. So you might say, I think I can figure this out myself. Um, we have a product we just launched called StoryMade. Um, and I won't get into a lot of detail, but if you go to storymadesites.com, you can see it's it's DIY websites based upon the marketing framework called StoryBrand, which is super easy to follow and help you launch your own website. So that's that's my pitch. That's awesome, man. That's very cool. Um, I will link all of that stuff in the show notes so it's nice and convenient for the listeners out there. Just click the link and see Joel, see what he's got for you. <laughs> so, hey, you Thanks, know, Evan. I'm trying to figure out, you know, the flow of this whole interview thing. And I thought, you know what? It might be a little cliche, but I'll try to put my own tiny little spin on it. I want to ask you a few random questions, kind of lighten it up a little bit. And let's just, we'll learn a little bit more about you in this process. Some lighthearted, a little bit more professional stuff. We'll just kind of rattle them through and uh, we'll wrap it up for today. All right. Sounds like a plan. (laughs) All right. So I've got six (laughs) questions here. All right. right. So first one, there's no any particular order. It's kind of a random, a random shake here, but what's something that most people don't know about you? That you're willing Ooh. to share, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Man, um, let's see. Most people don't know about me. Um, gosh, that's always a fun one, right? I know. I, I was like, I if, would I, say, if somebody asked me this, I wouldn't want them to because I'd be yeah. on the spot. So I'll do it to you. <laughs> no, that's good. Um, I think, you know, I, I love sci-fi. You know, I, I don't really come across as somebody who's like a, a sci-fi nerd necessarily, but I'm pretty like obsessed with everything from like Star Trek to Star Wars to really? anything space related. I would say specifically like if if something is involved with outer space in some way, I'm interested in it. Um, if it's outside the Earth's atmosphere, uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm interested in it. So that's space cool. sci-fi. That's awesome. I, I didn't know that. That's, that's really interesting. My four-year-old is Um, he's learned how to recite all of the planets and he always gets to, it's pronounced Uranus, not Uranus. Uranus, Okay. Uranus. And he says it very quick. So I'm sure that's what the teacher is doing at preschool as well. Yeah. But he doesn't say Pluto. I'm like, what happened to Pluto? He's like, dad, (laughs) Pluto's not a planet. And then he just recites the sun, Mercury, just goes through. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay. All right, so that is awesome. You know, I'll send him to you when he starts to watch Star Trek and oh, wants man. to learn all about it and geek out with somebody. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I, I, you know, to to piggyback on that, I've always wanted to go to space, and my, and my wife says you're never going to space. So you know, maybe my kids get to do it. That's been like a secret longing of mine. Like I might, we might have that opportunity in, in my lifetime. We'll see. Hey man, you might just need to keep going through this process we talked about and keep making another thousand dollars for like yeah. a long time. <laughs> right, for a long time. Yeah, I'm sure it will be expensive, but that that yeah. I mean that's cool. Just honestly, it just makes me nervous. But I don't I don't know yeah. anything about space, man. And I'm scared of heights. Did the, does the fear oh. go away when gravity goes away, or you know does it get I don't worse know because you're definitely not standing on the ground. I don't know, and you don't really know up from down. It all starts to blur together, right? I know. Well, here, let me rattle through these other ones real quick. Sure. Um, yeah. Respect your time on this. So in another life or later in life, what would be the dream career if you weren't able to do what you do now? Oh, man. In another life, I know exactly what it is. If I if I was born two decades ahead, I would have wanted to be a radio DJ. A radio DJ? A DJ. I, I would have... I loved the old school, like 70s, 80s, 90s DJ 
where you, before they pre-picked all the songs, I mean, nobody really listens to the radio anymore. Very few people do. Mm-hmm. But back when DJs actually had a say in the music and they were the one kind of having the option to spin what it is that their mix was. But I love I love talking on a microphone. Yeah. I love music. So yeah, that would have been it. Radio DJ. Oh, that's awesome. I love that. Okay, how about this? Goldfish or Cheez-Its? Cheez-Its. Really? Not even a question. Wow. Not even a question. Oh man, yeah. that's like my go-to like this versus that question now. And I'm going to continue to use it for the rest of my life. Oh my gosh. What started from a disagreement my wife and I were having as we were laying in bed, watching Netflix, winding down for the night. And I'm just chowing down on, we always get the oversized box of goldfish. Mm, Yeah. And I'm like, man, I love goldfish. And she's like, yeah, but Cheez-Its are better. I was like, whoa. I paused the TV. Are you serious? (laughs) Yeah. I thought everybody (laughs) was like me. And so I actually, this is a couple months ago, but I put it up on my Instagram story. <clears throat> at Evan Shank 75. Um, yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it turned out more people like Cheez Its. So what the heck? I, I don't know. They have know. more flavor, more but, flavor, more salt. But the people that did vote Goldfish, they DM'd me off of that story and they were like, I don't know what the other people are thinking. Like, how? <laughs> so it's a cult following, is what I'm finding. But there's yeah. more people that like the Cheez Its. Interesting. Yeah. So you're part of that. I, I think you could eat more Goldfish than you could Cheez Its. And I tend to. Yes. Uh, that's yeah. uh, that's they're, a personal problem filling. of mine. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of Goldfish. <laughs> um, favorite song to drum along to? Oh, man. Or genre. Gosh, a, you, you can do genre. Yeah. I mean, I love rock. I, I just love like 90s alt rock. That's mm-hmm. that anything in that period, time period. My drumming was most influenced by live. Do you remember the band Live? I don't know if you know. It might have been before your time. No, but no. Um, they were a really popular band in like the mid to late nineties. Um, okay. Just I don't know, just like solid rock drumming. Yeah, I, I don't know that there's a particular song. Let me think. Um, oh, you know, you know, you know, it was a fun song to drum to. What? There's a song. You know, Owl City. Yeah. You know, Owl City's more electronic, right? But there's right. a particular song. Um, on the wing, I think it's called. On okay. their his like first album, dude. It that's a fun yeah. song to drum too. But yeah, can you kind of yeah, like make your own part song. to it? I guess it has so much. If you listen to it, there's so many different levels of beats in the song that you can just you can play kind of whatever you want to it. That's and it has crazy. kind of this like quarter note triplet feel sort of thing. So yeah. Anyway, nice man. I just that's remember. not really. You know, it's funny. I said alt rock. That's not really alt rock. That's more like electronic but yeah, yeah not at all works. but that's okay that's okay yeah. <laughs> you you've got a you've got a broad palette that's a good thing yeah you're right, a right, you're yeah. a cultured man um yeah. okay so then the boring question well it doesn't have to be boring but you hear it a lot favorite book or podcast hmm. and it could be of all time or right now i mean whatever pops into your brain first yeah yeah, yeah. um the podcast oh man see that's a tough one because it depends on the season I'm listening to it, but you know what I'm listening to at the time. I think Seth Godin's podcast is Akimbo podcast is probably one of my favorites just because it's short and sweet and he gets to the point and right. I love it. That's kind of where I'm at in life right now, but I've liked longer form podcasts at different times. Um, as far as book, whoosh, that's another hard one too. One of my favorite books, um, cause I really like sort of anthropology stuff. Mm-hmm. So, um, Sapiens. Have you ever heard of that book? No. It's a long book, but it's really cool. It's kind of like the history of mankind, but it's super interesting. It sounds maybe uh-huh. boring, like something you'd read in school, but the way the author does it, he's just, it's brilliant, especially the audio book. Um, he just kind of goes over the history of mankind and how we became sapiens, homo sapiens became the dominant species. Just super interesting. Really cool book. Wow. Huh. That's, my ears are kind of perked to that. Huh. I'll yeah, it's a good one. Out. It was also, it, it was on the top of a ton of reading lists at one time. Yeah. I think like Obama, it was on his reading list and, you know, so it, it's, it, it's a really well-known book, but it's a good one. Yeah. I'm going to, I do the, I have to do audible on a lot of the stuff because yeah. I just, I'm a slow reader and, you know, that's just, that's where I live. So it's nice. Especially because, that book, because that book's really long. Well, so yeah. you, you'd want to be. Yeah. yeah. And, interesting. And, and actually, you know, uh, this isn't my favorite book. I'll shut up here in a second. No, you're good, but man. You know what book I'm listening to right now, an audio book that's super interesting is uh, Will Smith's oh, memoir. Oh, yeah. Will. Um, Mark Manson wrote it with him, and I love Mark Manson. But he, uh, 
it's just real. I just didn't think I'd be nearly as interested in it as I was. But yeah. his audiobook's great because Will Smith reads it, and you know, Will Smith, Will Smith. So <laughs> that's the best. Yeah, I saw all of the promo that they did in that YouTube series. That video, yeah. those videos that they were putting out, kind of promoing it. So I watched all of that backstory in the process of him writing it. I was like, I, I mean, I'm like sold on it. I have to read the book now. I'm so invested already. It's but, good. Okay, Duly it's a noted. good, it's a good book. And the audio book, it really feels like you're watching almost like a documentary, huh? Because he narrates it, and he, you know, he does it well. And that's just called Will, right? Just called Will. Will, yeah. Will by Will. Will and you'd like Will it because he gets he talks a lot about the hip hop and music industry. He talks a lot about acting and the the movie industry and TVs. So it's the behind the scenes. is It's just cool. It's a cool story. Hmm. I'll have to check that out. Last question for you. All right. What's your life going to look like in 12 months from now? <laughs> Gosh. Um, you have to speak it into existence. Yeah. This is the affirmation you know, I, I moment. Think, <laughs> yeah. I think a, a big portion for me, I, I mentioned we launched this product called StoryMade. Um, and a big portion for me is like selling some more of this product. I think in getting to the stage where I'm personally moving more in the, in the business side into like a little bit more coaching, I'd love to continue to do that. But I'd love to learn more about selling products and product. You know, we talked a lot about services today, but like, what does it look like to sell products, which is a little different. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd like to get to the point where that's a decent amount of revenue for for me and for us as a company. Uh, and I could go into personal dreams over the next 12 months, but you know, we just moved into a new house. I'm super happy with it. Things are good. So yeah, that, that, that's what I'd say at this there point. Go. There you go. I'm sure in the next 12 months, I'm going to make my way up there and visit. I'm, yeah, you should. That's in the next 12 months. The yeah. yeah, for sure. You got to come up. For sure. <laughs> Well, dude, thank you so much for taking the time and helping me figure this whole interview thing out as we went. Um, it's a, l a lot of really good stuff here. Um, and once again, something that's really important and, and Don Miller um, talks about this a lot is this key of repetition. Um, and I think, and you could probably correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think it's like you have to say something between eight and 12 times before it starts to stick for people, Yep. right? Yep. Mm -hmm. And so with that, we're constantly having ideas flowing through us, especially if you're entrepreneurial minded, you're already going from the notion slash idea into, okay, we can monetize it doing this or that or whatever. So you have this flood of ideas. So to have some practical um, guidelines to kind of go back to, especially like we talked about today, service-based is kind of more of where this conversation was oriented and focused, right. Right. is having these things of get out there and make a grand then work on your MVP. Don't worry about the LLC. You'll know when that needs to happen. I mean, it'll, the writing will be on the wall for the most part, right? Um, and then you're going back into building an audience and focusing on collecting the data and learning how you can continue to tweak things as you go, refine and continue to be laser focused on br bringing the most impact and value that you can in exchange for the most amount of money and trying to automate that process where you can. Past that, make some more money and past that, as you continue to refine and, and look back at what you're doing and how you can do it better and optimize, is get into your marketing to help you propel forward. Because marketing and sales, that's the thrust, right? That's mm -hmm. the thrust to your business. And we could do a whole episode on that too, the business. Oh, yeah, for Because sure. I love that illustration. But really, the product is your wings that provides the lift. That's what gets you airborne. But you require thrust from something to keep that plane moving forward so that it can climb altitude. Um, yep. And so that's where marketing can really come in and help you. So Joel, thanks for sharing all of this good stuff. And to you that's listening or watching this podcast, I really appreciate you. You can find me, Evan Shank 75 You can hang out with me as much as you'd like. We've got more episodes coming soon. Thank you for being here. Until next time. Peace. Well, that does it for this episode. You can always reach out to me directly on my Instagram at evanshank75 with any thoughts or questions you may have. I'd love to connect and hear your story. Make sure you follow and subscribe and also leave a review on whichever platform you're listening to this on. My only question to you is, which way now? <laughs>